Hello and welcome to the Cookbook Circle podcast. I'm Hannah. And I'm Victoria. And we've set out to review the UK's most popular cookbooks, those that you probably have at home and haven't opened in a while. We take one cookbook each episode to cook from and to stress test, digging out their best recipes, bringing them to life again, and hopefully inspiring you to do so too. Hello, Victoria. (laughs) Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the Cookbook Circle. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. We're a bit giggly today. We are. Very little sleep and too much coffee, probably, as per. Yeah, classic. What you've been watching, listening to, loving in the food world? Well, lots of things, but I am particularly intrigued by this new Netflix series called High on the Hog. Have you heard about it? (laughs) No. I've seen it on your High on the Hog. (laughs) Yeah. Is it about... (laughs) Is it about beef? No, nor cannabis. Yeah, that's what I thought. (laughs) It is. So it's a four part Netflix series and it's a it's based on a book of the same name by a writer called Jessica B. Harris. And it's about how African cuisine has influenced and basically underpinned what we see as American cuisine Ah. today. Cool. And how obviously the like, enslaved peoples that were taken from Africa brought a lot of their cooking techniques mm. and, and things like rice, for example, like how to grow rice to America and, and their food system is entirely based off that. And it is fascinating. Wow. Like it's so interesting. So like I said, it's four parts. I haven't finished it, but the first episode is all in Benin in West Africa. Right. And the presenter is Stephen Satterfield, who you might know him if you saw him, if you don't know him he's like he's a writer and a chef and a sommelier and he basically traces back where a lot of this people came from and therefore food came from and it's just it's so interesting he has this there's this one bit it's really emotional yeah. for a start like really really emotional for for him as a african-american man mm. And, and the whole team, actually, so it's like a, a full black creative team. Right. And, you know, also anyone who's presenting is a person of colour. And it, oh, it's just so interesting and good. And he, he has this one meal that, like, really stuck with me where they have a meal made by various women in the villages in Benin. And it's all pre-colonial food. Right. So the tastes and the textures are completely different from what you would Im- imagine or even what, like, Benin's food is like now. But so the food is like almost unrecognizable wow. and he talks about how it's just so so different the taste and the textures and it's fascinating and it goes the rest are in the states and they talk about kind of presidential food and things like that it's, that sounds so good yeah i haven't seen anything about it i definitely need to look it up that sounds great yeah it's great it's not it's definitely not only a food show obviously it's like a yeah it's not a cooking show it's a food about a show about food ways and just basically how american food and probably the american economy wouldn't be yeah. what it is without African food and African people that came there obviously not of their free will yeah yeah it's fascinating and really emotional I would absolutely recommend it. I can't wait to finish it actually high on the hog yeah nice but that's not what we're talking about today no it's not we are talking about one of the books on our master list called Cook's the cook's companion. companion new friend I missed out of the then sorry (laughs) before we start talking about that i will remind you of what we do here at the cookbook circle which is mostly talk a lot of shite but (laughs) it's true we put together all the kind of best cookbook lists that we could find online put them into one big old master list and each episode we take one of the the top books on that list we read it or most of it (laughs) we cook from (laughs) it and then we talk about it remember i used to have to look up a script for that now i know it off by heart (laughs) it only took 11 an episode <laughs> disclaimer we do not read every single word in a book <laughs> no especially not this one <laughs> especially not this one which is the biggest book i think we keep saying this right we've had the, the last few episodes we've kept talking about this is a tome this is a huge book <laughs> yeah. oh my god it's massive and we said yeah. massive about 10 times in the david thompson episode but this one takes the biscuit yeah this is a chonker of the chonkers like i know we say this again every time but this is the biggest book so far that we've had yeah over a thousand pages and it's hardback yeah it's huge 
I think this is the revised edition that we have mm. um, because I think it originally came out in like 96 or something and then they did a revised edition in the 2000s which added even more recipes so I think this is the chunkiest of the chunkers. Wow. Before we start talking about the book shall I tell you a little bit about Stephanie Alexander? Please don't know anything about her. Yeah we hadn't heard much about her before at all and actually the more I was reading about her and like all the chefs that speak about her the more I realised we know absolutely nothing about <laughs> the Australian food scene or at least I don't No, but she is really influential and obviously has had a massive impact so she she actually studied to become a librarian but then she took off to travel the world at the age of 21 and she said that for her the world at that time was France of course (laughs) it's always France Vic don't you know this (laughs) I'm gonna rename this podcast it's always France (laughs) Yeah, so she just loved the value and respect that they paid to food. She met her first husband who was from Jamaica and they opened their first restaurant in Melbourne, which was called Jamaica House in the 60s. It seemed like it was quite influential at the time and obviously introducing a lot of new food to the Melbourne food scene. But later on, she opened Stephanie's restaurant. And this seems like the big one that was in 1976. And it's been called like the heart of everything culinary in Australia. But I read a profile of her where it said it was quite unusual for a woman to name a restaurant after herself. (laughs) That usually it was only French men that seemed to do that. Yeah, she seems like quite a champion of women, actually, which I'll come to, but also makes me have a lot of respect for her. Love that. Yes, Stephanie's restaurant, loads of kind of big Aussie chefs started out there or counted as an influence. She turned 80 last year and there was a piece. Yeah, there was a piece about her in this Melbourne food and wine thing. And loads of big Aussie chefs were talking about how they interned there or they'd like been influenced by what they were doing it was all kind of low waste which is really when you think about that in the 70s ahead of its time I feel like that didn't hit here until the last like, decade probably yeah, even then yeah and she championed loads of Aussie ingredients which we'll get to in the book but at the time they were cooking in Stephanie's with things like wattle seed and bush tomatoes <laughs> and native limes and all these things that like most people had never heard of cool yeah so cool and then she, she really championed women in that restaurant as well so she had a lot of female staff and she would kind of just welcome anyone in who had a love for food and then she would train them up she sounded quite regimented and ordered and she liked to teach people different stuff but that closed in 97 after being open for like I said 21 years and it seems like since then she's been doing kind of a combination of books lots of different books but she also started this foundation called the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation in 2004 which is a not-for-profit to teach kids about food and like how food is pleasurable and how to grow stuff and what you can do with fresh ingredients and I think that comes through in this book as well it's like a big theme of what she wants to do is just educate on what you can do with ingredients and and children and teaching a love of food from an early age is obviously like a massive priority for her yeah fresh food especially exactly so there was actually a profile about of her in the Guardian by this chef Peter Gordon and he tells a story about how he went to a picnic with her in like his early career and she she brought something and he loved it and he said what recipe do you use for that and she was like oh I don't use recipes my dear I just make it up <laughs> love her so, yeah she's great she's got this really like instinct for food I, th- I feel like she might be the Aussie version or there might be the same kind of affection for her that we have for Nigel Slater maybe yeah. that this, this kind of like seasonal local just kind of doesn't have to be massively overcomplicated or fine dining just cook with what you have but yeah the book it's itself was originally published in 96 so I guess the year before that Stephanie's restaurant closed it sold over 500,000 copies and it seems like in various comments and stuff online that you read that loads of people have this book and it's like a, almost like a family heirloom some comment on that Guardian article was like a dad who's who had had it in his house and then when his kids left home they all left with a copy of it which amazing is, yeah I, I don't know if he wrote a book imagine that being its legacy I think that's so good yeah and it's just the kind of ethos of the book is that this book is for everyone for every day and it's all about ingredients and techniques and equipment that you can just use at home and there's close to a thousand recipes in here like we said it's appeared in a few lists we mentioned last week that it was in the telegraph's 25 greatest cookbooks of all time and diana henry had talked about it and she called it a great big huggable book 
it, Vic suggested that I should hug it because apparently I have no one else to hold me. But <laughs> I didn't say that, you know. If you didn't listen to last time's episode that I didn't say that. That is Hannah putting words into my mouth. <laughs> but if the shoe fits, my friend, hug a book. <laughs> Diana Henry said it's clearly the work of a lifetime. It was the first book I know of to use a cloth quarter binding. I'm not quite sure what that is. And I immediately fell for it. A handsome tome that you can use forever. And it's also an app now, apparently, this book. Oh, that would have been much more useful. <laughs> than this doorstop no it's it's great yeah yeah she's she's written books before and after this one most recently in 2018 but this book kind of seems to be the cornerstone like mainstay of what she's done it's all in alphabetical order of ingredients someone again in the comments was like you can tell that she's trained as a librarian because (laughs) because (laughs) she puts things in alphabetical order (laughs) of course that's what you learn, yeah. right? When you're training as a librarian, <laughs> the alphabet. I thought it would be in the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> Yeah, the last thing that kind of comes up and like I've mentioned is her use of Australian ingredients and in that Guardian piece by Peter Gordon it says she talks about how Australians should be eating kangaroo because it's an indigenous ingredient and that local food is usually better than the imported stuff even though some people seem to think eating kangaroo is like eating the national pet. <laughs> I mean we'll we'll get to this and there's a lot of those ingredients in this that we I mean we talk about ingredients that we can't get in the UK all the time but there's definitely <laughs> shit in here that we cannot get in the UK, like wallaby. Can I ask a question about kangaroos? <laughs> I can't guarantee that I will know the answer, but sure. So obviously in this book, and you, you obviously can buy kangaroo meat, uh-huh. but are they like farmed? <laughs> like, are there like kangaroo farms in, in big swathes of Australian countryside where they're farmed for meat? Because like, as we know, mm-hmm. kangaroos are absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Like they're like they're so muscly, and but I guess what I'm trying to say is like, how do you, would you keep them there if they were farmed? How do you catch a kangaroo? Well, she says in the chapter that <laughs> all members of the Macropididae. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so how's, sorry. How's, how's it go? No, it's the <laughs> it's the obviously um the family that kangaroo and wallabies belong to. But she says they're protected from random hunting by state legislation. Um, but a small number of the more populous species are harvested under permit. Oh, so they are wild. There, it's like game. Some species of kangaroo and wallaby have increased in numbers, and an annual harvest of kangaroos and wallabies in Tasmania is conducted by registered shooters who work at night. The size of each state's harvest is determined annually and is based on scientific assessment that takes into account natural phenomena that might have affected numbers so i guess it's like a call that's fascinating it is that's so interesting i don't know if i i like the word harvest for animals but the, you know <laughs> but that is so interesting i've never eaten kangaroo no well Just... she's got some ideas for how you can there's the kangaroo tail soup the warm salad Tail. of roasted or grilled kangaroo. I guess it's quite lean. Like I said, they're very muscly. A bit like horse. I'd imagine it tastes a bit like a horse. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. You're right. They are terrifying. I mean, a lot of people think they're <laughs> cute, but I just feel like they punch you in the face. No, yeah. They stand up and you sometimes see them like, you know, go into people's windows or whatever. They look like a like a very, very tonk man. Like they're so <laughs> muscly. How much do you bench? <laughs> I don't even know what it means to bench something. So that was very much a repeated <laughs> phrase. Would you bench a kangaroo? Probably not. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it's going to taste like. And if I ever go back to eating meat, that's probably not going to be tough on my list. I'm not going to lie. No. I feel like you can buy kangaroo burgers in like Iceland here, but I'm sure it's not the mm. same. I'm sure they're like 22% kangaroo and the rest is just beef or Grim. chicken or something. And also we shouldn't be eating kangaroo because we don't have any kangaroos here. Like, And I think that's her point isn't it with a lot of this stuff is that you should be eating what's local to you and for them yeah that's easy to come by it like you were talking about like bush tomatoes and stuff before like like we said i don't really know anything about australian food in terms of what is native there and what's not she talks a little bit about that in this book so every ingredient has like an intro page doesn't it so he kind of writes about the history or something interesting and i yeah it, it, it sounds just fascinating to me like because they obviously have a climate where the lot of the like tropical foods could grow yeah and obviously 
obviously then it's also very far away from us everywhere <laughs> yeah so you know obviously importing isn't that efficient or you know environmentally friendly so basically i would like to learn more about australian produce yeah um, maybe we'll go on a tour. Well, I think the cookbook circle goes down under. It needs to be <laughs> top of our list. We'll start the, uh, the crowdfunder ASAP. Because they have such an amazing restaurant scene as well, don't yeah, they? Yeah. Like Melbourne and Sydney and like everywhere. Like, And obviously their coffee is to die for. Yeah. And they invented brunch as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. Yeah. Guys, you know, if any rich listeners want to fly <laughs> us, we're here. We're ready. We can book, take some time off work. Yeah, but, like, just, just, yeah just send us an email but anyway apart from it being absolutely massive did you have any glaring first impressions of the book no that was it. it's massive <laughs> that's my only thought were there enough pictures for you there no definitely not enough pictures um there's no pictures of the food well imagine that would have added to the page count significantly i know there's some lovely like you know pictures of livestock and various like pastures like yeah. dotted through they're unnecessary in my opinion <laughs> Um, but yeah, exactly. If there were pictures in this book, it would make it twice the size. So like, I'll forgive that. Okay. That's nice of you. Although, and we will talk about it later. There was a couple of things that I would have liked to know what it should have looked like. <laughs> oh, I feel a story coming up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, well, I texted you, right? There was, there was this, these, um, chocolate hedgehogs. Yeah. Right. Which, so a chocolate hedgehog is something I think a bit different here in the UK. You would have it at school. <laughs> it's like a cornflake cake, right? Right, like right. Yeah. Like cake with like some kind of syrup in it. That's how I would imagine a chocolate. But so I read this recipe and it said you needed wheat biscuits. Mm. And I presumed that that would be like a Weetabix, <laughs> like a breakfast mm. <laughs> wheaty biscuit. Famed for their <laughs> flavor and the richness <laughs> that they bring to every meal. <laughs> but I was like, okay, you know, you break that up, it could be a bit spiky, exactly like a hedgehog. Yes. It turns out that that's not the case at all. I think a wheat biscuit is like a digestive digestive biscuit what we call a digestive biscuit mm -hmm. and a chocolate hedgehog is like it's not hedgehog shaped at all it's like a chocolate tiffin like fridge cake right. with like chocolate on the top so it sounds absolutely amazing and delicious but i feel like it's misleading with the hedgehog vibes where does the hedgehog come into it then i don't know listeners call us <laughs> yeah let us know why is it called a hedgehog anyway but yes no i really liked it and i i like the way it's laid out yeah so like each chapter so for example i've got the pork chapter open here she'll give a little her, like i said her little like history of pork or whatever the ingredient is and then she'll talk a little bit about what's in season yeah. the margins are my favorite thing about this book i think yeah there's a lot of hidden gems in there yeah there's be a list in the margin of what pork goes with for mm -hmm. example how to store it and then like how to cook it so obviously for a meat, you can cook it in all different types of ways. So she's got a paragraph on roasting, braising, grilling, if it's minced, roasting and all that stuff. So yeah, it just goes on and on like that. So she's, that's at the beginning. And then the recipes come later. Yeah. Which is great because it really teaches you how to cook something. Absolutely. I also liked the measurement conversions at the beginning because I've yeah. bitched about cups previously on <laughs> here. But that, that does all the conversions for you. Yeah, she has the seasonality of each of the ingredients in the chapters as well right yeah it's just it's like cookery school in a book maybe <laughs> it really really is and uh, well, you talked about Nigel Slater before but it feels like a Nigel Slater book in that mm. I've got something in I don't know what I want to do with it you go to that chapter and there's definitely going to be something you want to cook we've done so many of these books that are trying to educate you on the ingredients you know, Simon Hopkinson, even Samin two episodes ago, this, Julia Child, I feel like it's almost an episode in itself to just go through which, if, if someone wanted to buy the ultimate, like, teaching cookbook for someone, yeah, which one would it be? It would be really hard. But in terms of scale, this probably comes out on top. Yeah, absolutely. And like, like you said earlier, if you're sending someone off to university, this one, I, for me, so far, beats out those other mm. ones because, as I said, it's probably better as an app. Yeah. The recipes are fairly simple. Yeah, it's usually like two recipes to a page, right? They're never very, very long with loads of different stages. Yeah, exactly. I also like how, and I wanted to ask you about this, how you feel about this, that in the ingredients list, yeah. it 
basically tells you how to prepare the thing. For a recipe I did, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, spoiler alert, it involved sweet potatoes. It said in the ingredients list, sweet potatoes boiled and mashed. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the the instruction for what to do with those potatoes is in the ingredients list, which I think is not always the case, right? Sometimes it's just a list of ingredients and then the step by step is how to do everything. Yeah. What do you prefer? I actually prefer when it's in the body or in the instructions of the recipe because I've said before that I'm a lazy little shit and I just skim the ingredients and I'm like okay I need sweet potatoes or I need you know onions or whatever and I go to the shop and then when I come back and I start cooking I'm like shit they're meant to be mashed and whatever (laughs) boiled and mashed and so I feel like it does no harm to just have that as the first step in a recipe but I totally get why you wouldn't do it in a book this big I imagine they were just like trying to keep it as condensed as possible and that's why loads of recipes have ended up in the margin and stuff as well because they probably yeah. just were like shit lads we're reaching the page count on this one we better scale it back <laughs> but I love the margin recipes I feel like you're in her brain like oh she just remembered that you could do this here you go try this like olive oil mashed potatoes in the potato section like you don't need a whole recipe to tell you how to make olive oil mashed potato it's just like here's some techniques I've already yeah. talked about add olive oil at the stage instead of this I'd love to know how long it took her to write this to bring it together yeah I think when we spoke about Julia Child we talked about that being like a couple of years work and this is significantly larger than that book so I can't yeah. even begin to imagine and uh, as far as I'm aware it's just her right Julia Child there was three of them working on it yeah she does have some people in the acknowledgements that have helped her out or tested but it does seem like a lot of it is it's all Steph our mate Steph um, there's a couple of recipes where a few quite a few recipes actually where there's they're from other chefs like David Thompson makes an appearance Oh, I didn't see him. In the egg section, yeah. I think it's called brother-in-law eggs or something. Ah. Oh, Darina Allen appears actually, I think, in the soda bread section. Oh, nice. At Claudia Roden's orange cake as well I don't I never know how I feel about that like I guess it's just that they want to pay homage to these people's (laughs) amazing recipes but I just never know how I feel about that because that Middle Eastern orange cake by Claudia Roden I've seen pop up again and again and again it's almost a classic yeah yeah I just never know does it need to be included in another cookbook I'm not sure. The jury's out in that one. I'll let you know as my thought process develops. (laughs) I guess, I guess with this one, because it's just, it's supposed to be a, yeah, an encyclopedia based on ingredient. It's it's kind of forgivable rather than, yeah, it's not her cookbook about her recipes. It's, this is what you can do with these amazing ingredients. Yeah, that's true. So Victoria, (laughs) what did you make? What did I cook? I cooked three things, which is, yeah. And I know that you like to do three things. (laughs) She rolled her eyes when she said that, just for the listener. That wasn't like a complimentary thing. That was like, Hannah's a fucking teacher's pet. She is a teacher's pet. Who is the teacher? (laughs) The teacher is the listener. You like to call yourself lazy, but like, really, I am the lazy one. No, not true. (laughs) I'm more lazy than you. You better believe it. Um, So I did three things. Fun fact, I may have done two out of three of them sweet. Yay! And I think this will be my first... One is definitely sweet. One is a maybe sweet and we'll get to that. Okay. Did you swap the sugar out for salt in that one? We've all been there. <laughs> we'll never know. Um, <laughs> so the first thing I did was the char su. Ah. Like a chinese roast pork. Yeah. Because if you eat pork, who doesn't love char su? Right. Um, I saw it and I was like, interesting that it's in this book because I would never think to, that I'd be able to make it at home. Mm. But I skimmed the ingredients list and I basically had everything in. Oh, great. So I was like, boom, let's do it. If you don't know what char siu is, it's that kind of red ringed pork that you get in the Chinese, like sometimes on its own, sometimes in rice, whatever. It's Mm -hmm. so nice. Kind of sweet. It's amazing. So it's really easy. So you get a pork fillet. Managed to find pork this time. (laughs) Weren't doing it with sausages then? No. (laughs) Oh God. Can you imagine? Um, And you chop it up and you marinate it in a mixture of deep breath. Soy sauce, mirin, rice vinegar, hoisin sauce, honey, sesame oil, garlic, ginger, some cinnamon and some five spice. All good things. All great things. It's a big old recipe. It's wiped me out of mirin. 
<laughs> so you just kind of put it into the fridge. The recipe in this book asks for red rice vinegar. Okay. Which I imagine is what gets the color. But also I think that maybe when you go to the China, a Chinese restaurant, that's maybe coloring Yeah, maybe. as well. I was not going to frankly fuck around and try and find red rice vinegar because I didn't think I'd be able to. So I don't had rice vinegar. So I was yeah. like, it will still taste the same. You marinate it in the fridge for it's three plus hours. I left it for kind of half a day. Mm-hmm. And then you roast it in the oven. Interestingly, she asked you to put it directly on the oven shelf so you put it directly on there I imagine so that it doesn't get like crispy on the bottom yes. and so like the heat goes all around it you put like a tray of water underneath to catch any like dripping fat Right. I also wonder if that helps to kind of keep it moist yeah you would think because obviously pork is quite dry generally yeah. and you're not adding the sauce to it or anything yeah and then you kind of get it out chop it up we served it with rice and some salad it was great it tasted like bang on that sounds like something that you could knock up on a weeknight then yeah quite an easy dinner now you know how to make it you'll probably make it again right yeah exactly i mean i was a bit sad about like throwing all the marinade away after because it's a lot it's like a, a cup of soy sauce and mm. half a cup of mirin but yeah i would definitely make it again and it was really easy nice loved it it was a hit didn't know i could make it home so that's fun the second thing i made which is the maybe sweet thing <laughs> is the sweet potato cornbread or the corn pone as she calls it oh corn pone yeah i'd never heard that before so she she kind of talks about it in the book she talks about it corn pone is a cross between a pudding a cake and a bread originally it was a thin cake baked on a heated stone there are many variations of corn pone throughout the south of the usa some are made with sweet and condensed milk some with cornmeal and some with astonishingly large amounts of butter <laughs> such dishes are eaten as bread alongside meat or just as often as a sweet pudding so it's basically like it's up to you what you do with it wow. i love cornbread but i never really make it i feel like i've had some disasters so i had loads of sweet potatoes in for my veg box yeah again another really easy one so you boil and mash the potatoes and then to the potato mix you add 125 grams of butter eggs brown sugar bicarb salt and cinnamon that does sound quite sweet doesn't it yeah because the brown sugar i think and the cinnamons autumnal taylor swift vibe (laughs) yeah pumpkin spice latte and then you you kind of food process that so it's like really nice and smooth and then you add polenta like two cups of polenta and a cup of yogurt oh nice yeah it's that like light and you put in the oven for 45 minutes what i have to say about this book is that all of the timings were absolutely bang on for me that's true I really appreciated that. Yeah, we appreciate you, Steph. Because <laughs> I think when I've made cornbread before, it's like it takes a lot longer than you think it takes because it's so like dense. Quite dense, yeah. That sounds great, though. Did it taste really good when it was warm? Yes, it tastes amazing when it's warm. Today, I'm gonna like to- I made it yesterday. I'm gonna toast it up. Yeah, you- you'll see on my pictures. I put some maple syrup on it because I couldn't Ooh. resist. I was like, that's good. But it- I think it would also be good with like a bacon or like like a maple butter or something. Like, yeah, warm. that sounds great. Here's um here's the thing. <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. Let's go. Here we go. Um I was so proud of it. It's got like this beautiful colour, like all this other stuff. And I was like, oh, it's quite dense, isn't it? But I was like, well, it's fine, it's mostly sweet potato. Yeah. And it went on with my day. And then I was cooking something else in the evening, and I opened one of my cupboards and I saw <laughs> my box of eggs. <laughs> And I was like, did I put eggs in the cornbread? I didn't put eggs in the cornbread. Oh, we have all been there. (laughs) So that's why it's so dense. So it needs four eggs and I did not put one egg in there. (laughs) Not even one. Not even one egg made that mix. I don't know what's wrong with me. That literally happens all the time. When I was baking <laughs> professionally, I did that a couple of times. And you put cakes in the oven and they come out like biscuits. And you're like, what the fuck have I done here? But I mean, the fact that it was still was nice yeah. without is testament. Yeah, so basically okay. I made a vegan cornbread. So... <laughs> <laughs> the yogurt. Oh yeah, the yogurt. I didn't make a vegan cornbread, but you could make it with vegan yogurt, I'm sure, and it would work. There you go. So... I fucked that up, but didn't know I'd fucked it up to about six hours late. <laughs> so definitely would make it again with the egg. But, you know, hilarity ensues as ever with me. Um, I also would make it because it was easy for like a party or like a barbecue or something. Like, it'd be a great thing to take along to show off. Yeah, it just sounds like something that'd be nice 
for the cup of tea. Yeah. Like a pancake or something. Yeah, because it, it is sweet. And obviously, if you add maple syrup like I did, then yeah, mm. it's going to be super sweet. But it's not, but it doesn't have to be. Like it could be like a bread. Yeah, loved it. Nice. And then finally, carrying on this like Southern USA <laughs> thing, which I think I've, you know, got. Well, firstly, it's, it's getting warm here, right? Like it's early summer, so it's getting warm. But also that Southern baking book is like haunting me around the internet, like with the gorgeous like biscuits on the front. Biscuits. Yeah. And I just know I'd love it. I should just buy it. Anyway, so I made the peaches and cream pie. <gasps> Oh, wow. Yeah. I love this. I love the baking, Victoria. This is brilliant. Tell me more. So as we, oh, sorry, peaches and cream tart. I've written it down wrong in my notes. No, you just really wanted to be Southern. You're like, it's a pie. It's a pie. This was so fun. So obviously, as we know, I don't, I don't do pastry. And it's been hot this week. I thought about it and I thought about following her recipe. And then I thought, you know what? I don't want to. So I bought, I also don't have a pie tin. Yeah. It's not meant to be. So I bought a pastry case. Mm-hmm. but I love peaches and we're, yeah. like I said we're in early summer there's peaches everywhere and I was like I just I love them and I love yeah. it because I bought lots of extra so there's loads in my house oh yeah so what's interesting about this recipe I thought and may, maybe you, you can tell me that I'm wrong is that um so it's a peaches and cream pie but the cream is not cream it's sour cream oh interesting yeah so you whip up some egg yolks, mm-hmm. sugar, vanilla, some peach snaps, which I don't have because I'm not 14. <laughs> so <laughs> I added, <laughs> I did have some peach cordial. So I put a little bit of that in. I was like, that's going to have the same effect. <laughs> nice. You're making the cornbread vegan. You're making the pie for teetotalers. Here we go. I'm not going to buy a whole bottle of peach snaps. Like, come on. No, mate. No, no, it's no. It's not way. very nice. And sour cream. So you whip that up into like a mousse. Right. right. And then you pour it on the top of your peaches, which you've cut up and put in your pastry shell in like concentric circles. Looking nice. beautiful. And I'm so sad that I didn't take a photo of my beautiful peaches all laid out. Aww. Because then you put the stuff on top and you, you don't see them again. But they were beautiful. You cook that up in the oven until it's set. Take it out. Leave it to rest for five minutes. And then you brulee the top. Ooh, fun. Yeah. I obviously don't have a blowtorch. But I just did it under the grill. Yeah. And that was very fun. Ah. So just a bit of brown sugar and then under a really hot grill for a couple of minutes. And and it was beautiful. Because the sour cream, I guess, takes the kind of that super kind of rich creaminess away. Yeah. So you've got like the kind of brulee top and then the peaches and the cream and the pastry. Oh, it's just so Yum. nice. I bet that tasted so good. It really was. You're supposed to eat it at hot or at room temperature. So I ate a little bit hot and a little bit later. For research purposes, of course. Of course. If I made it again, which I definitely would, I think, because also it's quite impressive as a thing. I'd put more fruit in, I think. Okay. Or thicker slices or something, because I'd want, I think I cut it quite thin, and I'd, I think I'd want that more like peachy, just because peaches are so good, especially if they're like, you get them and they're ripe, and I did, and yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my like southern baking fun time. I love it. Quite different, actually, both of those things. Mm. I've got loads of sweet potatoes, so I might have a go at that cornbread. That sounds amazing. Yeah, don't forget the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I've got loads if you want them. <laughs> What did I make? I was thinking how amazing it would be if we'd chosen the same thing from this. The odds. Because there's so a thousand recipes. I know. Like, honestly, I was, when I was leafing through it, I don't know if you felt the same way, but I was a bit overwhelmed. I was like, shit, I actually don't know where to begin. Yeah. That's the thing about this book for me, is that you almost need to start with the ingredient. Yeah. What have I got? Yeah. That Rather than being like, oh, I just feel like making something. I'm going to leaf through a thousand recipes and just... Yeah. whereas a lot of the other books like I don't know like Ottolenghi or someone like that you're kind of looking for inspiration I was a bit overwhelmed and I didn't really know what to pick but the whole cheese chapter to me <laughs> fucking hell I love it so Massive much as well the cheese chapter oh it's so good and um I don't know if you noticed but there's loads of fritters in this book I was just like every, I realized that every page corner that I was turning down was like a, a new fritter there was like <laughs> 
<laughs> raclette cheese fritters and cauliflower flour fritters and carrot fritters and anchovy and sage and I was like oh and then I realized I was just gonna <laughs> exclusively be making fritters but I did make the savory ricotta fritters oh she suggests this is like a little pre-dinner snack with a drink and a mousse bouche a little mousse bouche it's relatively simple you just mix together ricotta Oh my God, I found it so hard to find ricotta. I had to go to three supermarkets. Really? Do we live in London or not? How hard should it be to find ricotta? That's fine. I'll talk to the government. (laughs) The ricotta, quite a bit of parmesan, 50 grams of parmesan, parsley and oregano. I feel like quite a lot of parmesan is your theme. (laughs) Generally. Oh, quite a lot of parmesan. I'm in. (laughs) I'll make it. It genuinely is. And I always grate it on a microplane. So it's always just like <laughs> this little cloud of, of parmesan. It's amazing. Um, you could use pecorino there if you wanted, she says. Oh, Steph. Good luck finding pecorino if you can't find ricotta. ricotta. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so you mix together ricotta, parmesan, herbs. I couldn't get oregano, so I just used parsley, which I think you could probably sub in whatever you fancied there. A clove of garlic and an egg yolk. And you mix that all together. You're meant to form it into walnut-sized balls. (laughs) How many balls, Steph? (laughs) How many balls, Steph? No, she says mix 24. She's very clear. I made them into slightly bigger fritters things because I just wanted to eat them myself. And I wasn't sure. (laughs) There was nobody around. Yeah, I feel like walnut-sized fritters. I guess if they're like an amuse-bouche, like you say. Well, this is it. And I realised then as I cooked them that that would work really well because you would just have a delicious little mouthful. Basically, you you shape them and then you chill them for half an hour and then you egg and breadcrumb them when they come out of the fridge oh like a little nugget yeah little little ricotta nugget uh you're meant to deep fry them and I didn't because I just we said this before but I always shy away from deep frying a little bit and I Mm. always convince myself that if I just shallow fry it it will be fine I think that was a bit of a fuck up on my part to be fair because because the ricotta is so delicate it probably needs to be like fully surrounded by oil to make like a shell that's firm and then you can just really easily fish it out of the oil and it's it retains its shape but because I kind of shallow fried them and they were slightly bigger than they were meant to be a couple ended up like breaking a bit and not looking Um, Okay. so hot but they were still absolutely delicious yeah they sound great that's literally it you just fry them for like three or four minutes till they're golden brown drain them on some kitchen paper and they're good to go but oh my god they're really tasty like I would definitely make them for people and, and they would be so impressive if you're having people around you know your, your three friends um, <laughs> Chelsea Nigel <laughs> and now this book and me yeah yeah four friends sorry sorry yeah you could probably make everything beforehand just have it in the fridge even I, I imagine it wouldn't detract if you just did the breadcrumbs step and just put them in the fridge and then just fry them off as people arrived and serve them up oh my god that would be so good it's just like hot and cheesy and herby and oh yum hot and cheesy band name of the week <laughs> it's my band name for life <laughs> So they were really good. Love that. Yeah. The second thing that I made, so I got, like you, we talk about getting our vegetable box quite a lot. And I got some fennel this week. Ooh, I got fennel actually too. And I never know. Yeah. Have you made anything with it yet? No, but you're going to tell me something to make? Yes. Great. Honestly, I never know what to do. And the last time I did Nigel's recipe, which was the grilled one with mozzarella and olives, super simple. That's also great. But this one is fennel braised with balsamic vinegar and honey. Ooh. And oh my God, it's so good. I know that fennel's not for everyone because it's kind of that aniseedy flavor, right? That's a bit strong. But this is great. And I don't feel like that flavor is too strong because it's competing with the balsamic, which is also quite strong as well. Super strong, yeah. So basically you just like put some butter and oil in a casserole dish and you quarter the fennels and you brown them off on all sides and I, I let them get quite brown and she she said it takes up to 15 minutes again like spot on with the timing to your point and then you add a sprig of rosemary you keep Ooh. the heat pretty high and you drizzle on quite a lot of balsamic vinegar and then you let that bubble up and you turn around the fennel so that it's kind of coated on all sides with the balsamic and then you drizzle over some honey and just a little bit of water and then you you put the lid back on and you reduce the heat really low and it kind of just like bubbles along in there and cooks through and soaks up all the yes. juices and because fennel has loads of little layers like all that delicious vinegary honey gets into all the different oh. things honestly I just oh. 
I just I would never think to do something like that with fennel. No. And it was so good. And like being a vegetarian, you don't get to braise very much. <laughs> We're deprived of braising. <laughs> but now I know that you I'm can sorry. braise the fennel. And it was just amazing. It was really, really good. Wow. Yeah. I would never put those three flavors together. Yeah. How did, did you just eat it like on its own? Like was it like a, for like a starter? Or? Yeah. She says that you should have it as like an accompaniment to a roast or something mm. like that like a meat dish I made the ricotta fritters and the fennel on the same day and I just ate them they didn't really nice. go very well together but you know I had a free afternoon so that's what I did love that yeah that is really really good I would highly recommend that she also says you can use matured red wine vinegar instead of balsamic but I feel like a lot of the red wine vinegar you get here isn't isn't that great it's, you have to pay quite a lot for like a premium nice yeah this is a shit story the last thing that I made <laughs> It's not a shit story. Believe in your stories. So we talked about me always making three things each episode, but I feel like that third thing that I make, I'm going to start calling it the like cop out dish, the cookbook circle (laughs) cop out, because it's just just me wanting to make a third dish for the point of it. But I'm not really arsed to put loads of effort in. So (laughs) I just like seek out something really simple. But I made her Greek country salad. Oh, which is just super, super easy. It was partly because, again, because I got loads of baby cucumbers in my vegetable box again. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah. But what, what does one do with a baby? Oh, I, th- I just eat them, yeah. I mean, I don't love cucumber. People who don't like coriander, you know the, how they say that that's like a gene thing. There is a thing for cucumber as well, but we just don't get, we're underrepresented in the food world. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But I get it. I know a few people that don't like cucumber, now including you. In the beginning, I was always like, oh, what? How can you like cucumber? It's so inoffensive. But it's so permeating. Like if there's cucumber yeah. in something, you can taste it. It's yeah. a bit like coriander, I suppose. Yeah, like yeah. You, you know it's there. Um, so I get it. Thank you for your understanding. <laughs> You're welcome. But I felt like I made just like a Lilliputian version of this dish because <laughs> I use baby cucumbers. And then she says to use normal sized tomatoes. And I got these like gorgeous little yellow honey drop ones. So everything was just like tiny that I was cooking, cutting up. It was like a little miniature version. <laughs> and I'm very tall, so that's quite ironic. <laughs> so you literally just have tomatoes, cucumbers, spring onions, a green pepper, and you chop them all up and put in a bowl. And then you just put olive oil over and you let it stand for half an hour. Then you add some red wine vinegar and Kalamata olives. Ooh. Then you just sprinkle over some feta. Got some really nice, like proper Greek feta. And that's it. It's just like you're classic greek salad it's very simple but but tiny but simple but tiny <laughs> <laughs> but it was very delicious and I, I i quite like that step of letting the olive oil sit on the veg for a while to mm. i don't know kind of marinate a little bit and it was delicious but that was my cup out dish of the week yay <laughs> i was hoping that you would do because i saw they had do you see those honey madeleines <gasps> Because I know that you got a new Madeline tin recently. I did. I did not see the Madelines. And I feel like I oh, looked no. for Madelines, but I didn't see them. That makes me sad. They're on page 498. I just, because I, I saw them and I was like, oh, I hope, I hope, I wonder if Hannah will make those. Oh. And they sound great. Okay, I might have to make them. Because, yeah, I'm on a Madeline buzz at the moment. I like how she spells castor sugar, castor. Yeah, castor. <laughs> Uh, I guess, yeah, they're in the honey section, Uh, believe it or not. Yeah, because I've made... We were taught in pastry school to make madeleine with melted butter, but I made them the other weekend and I browned the butter. Ooh. It's rare that I would think that anything that I make is half decent, <laughs> but these are so good. So I'm going to combine that brown butter method with this honey. I'll let you know oh, how yeah. it goes. Yeah, but that's great. Apart from now the honey madeleines, mm-hmm. is there anything else in this giant book that you'd have liked to have cooked? <laughs> so much, because every time I open so it, much. I see something else. Passion fruit shortbread biscuits, I thought sounded Ooh great passion fruit just love there was a teradot sauce that she suggests serving with falafel there's a falafel recipe in here that looks good as well but this teradot sauce is like walnuts garlic and tahini all blitzed up you know i love anything with tahini your jam yeah so i thought that sounded really good there was a sweet corn soup with spiced butter the spiced butter had cumin seeds and some other kind of spice in there and it looked really yummy like i said the whole cheese chapter there was (laughs) These flaky goat's cheese biscuits, which would be right on your southern baking vibe. <laughs> yeah. The raclette cheese fritters, all the fritters. Yeah, there was a lot. There is a lot that I wanted to make here. What about you? 
Yeah, me too. Like I will be going through this again. I think it's another one of those ones where like when I get my veg box yeah. and I've got something like fennel or whatever, I don't know what to do with. I'll go through it. But there was, do you see the banana tarts with butterscotch sauce? Yeah. Almost made those, but I never buy bananas in good enough time to, for them to ripe up enough to bake with. Yeah. Um, I'm just not like the other girls, you know. <laughs> the old banana girls. <laughs> the old banana cake girls. I guess I was on a tart thing. I thought the mushroom tartlets looked great. Nice. There was like a in the in the margins of yeah. the chicken section, there was soy chicken, like a Hyannese chicken rice thing. You kind of boil the chicken, blanch the chicken, whatever you call it, with yeah. with soy sauce and mirin in nice. the water in the chicken stock instead of just plain water and then just like serve it with rice. That sounded amazing. I almost did that. Yeah load of the other stuff in the peaches section as well was great there was other tarts and like ice cream crumble i almost did because she suggested you could do a peach shortcake because she has a strawberry shortcake recipe Mm. um and i was like never really sure what that was that's just sounded like a thing but it's like a scone basically i looked it up yeah but I, you needed cream and I don't like cream so well maybe I don't know I often sub in like sour cream or creme fraiche yeah I feel like you could do it with creme fraiche and peaches basically just it's great and everything I made felt super simple and yeah. super like I didn't have to go across town for any ingredients totally unlike you and ricotta unfortunately but I thought that was a one-off total one-off I'm going to have loads of people being like, you can buy ricotta in Sainsbury's <laughs> and Tesco and Asda and Morrison's and Waitrose. And probably your, you know, corner shop. Yeah, yeah, totally. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Shall we rate? Let's rate. So our rating system, which we have to talk about every time, it's out of five. And they are the following categories. Number one, usability and accessibility. That's one, not two. Uh, ingredients used. Can we get them? Can we find them? Uh, ricottas. Well, we'll see what Hannah thinks about ricotta. Aesthetics. Do we like the way it looks? Would we be happy to have it on our shelf? Is it lovely? Veggie friendly, self-explanatory. And then our newest edition, Inspirability. Like, do we feel like we want to pick it up and cook from it? Are we excited by it? Also, the rating system changes every episode. So it depends on the book. Last episode, we rated David Thompson out of Gal and Gals. Um, <laughs> we rated Samin Nosrat's Salt Fat Acid Heat out of uh, Pots of Water, Salty as the Summer <laughs> Sea, <laughs> etc. So we thought for this one, because it is such an ode to these things and we are excited to see them we are going to rate the cook's companion out of Aussie Aussie ingredients (laughs) I started that out trying to do an Australian accent because I've been constantly watching Married at First Sight Australia and I've been really working on my accent but um, I copped out sorry could you do your ratings in in an Australian accent please no I don't want to alienate our friends there so no I won't be doing that Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> well, that's a disappointment. Maybe I'll do it in my Australian <laughs> accent, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you're brave. Right. We can cut that out. Um, <laughs> no. Hannah, tell us about your rating. Okay. I feel like <laughs> the only points I want to take off here, I think ingredients, you could detract some points because you can't get everything here like wallabies or bugs or yabbies, yeah. things like that. But I don't think that's really fair to the whole ethos of the book, which is about using local stuff. And I'm sure we could sub stuff in. So I'm not going to take a point off there. What do you sub in for a wallaby? <laughs> um, <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> chicken chicken it's always chicken (laughs) the wallabies of the farm (laughs) very accessible very veggie friendly there's lots of options in here i'm going to take off half a point each for one for aesthetics just it's a personal thing i don't love the cover it's rainbow (laughs) and there's um, there's a weird little clip art bowl next to the name i just i don't personally it's not for me and weirdly inspirability I'm going to take a half point off because I feel like to my point earlier it can be a bit overwhelming if you were just dipping into this being like what can I make for dinner tonight oh my god you'd be there all day whereas if you had that ingredient to start with it's better to work backwards for there so for that reason I'm taking off <laughs> I said I come on dragon's <laughs> death and for that reason Victoria <laughs> I'm out <laughs> no I'm going to take a half point off each and so I'm giving it four Aussie ingredients out of five <laughs> good that's good I 
like good. that. That's good. We like great. it. Good. Okay. That's good. Good. Cool. What, what are you giving it, Victoria? <laughs> yeah, similar. I feel basically the same way to you. I am not going to take a point off for aesthetics because I, <gasps> I know. I know. Even though it doesn't have pictures. I also don't love the cover, but I can forgive that because, you know, I want to. So <laughs> I'll make my own rules about what I think is acceptable. But I just love the way it's laid out. I Like I said, I've said the fucking margin thing. Love it. It's so comprehensive and brilliant and easy and I'm a Stephanie Alexander stan now so I'm not taking a point off that but I am taking half a point off for inspirability the same as you for the exact same reason that mm-hmm. I'm not going to come to it thinking oh what fun thing can I make for my friends they were coming over yeah but I would go to it for oh I've got this ingredient in a set like I said in the same way I was with any like Nigel Slater book I've yeah. got this vegetable I've got this ingredient I've got some kangaroo what am I going to do with it you know so it's it's a different it feels like a different type of inspirability but I know I'd be able to find something in it so it still gets half a point so it's four and a half from me four and a <gasps> half Aussie ingredients from me wow I would have to listen back to the back catalogue which I'm never going to do but I feel like this <laughs> might be the first time that you raised it higher than me is it maybe maybe mama fuku you gave a bit higher because i couldn't cook anything from yeah. that but hmm interesting Loved we need it. our fan club to be set up to do these kind of stats for us yeah circlets hit us come up. on circlets get in gear <laughs> next time next time on the cookbook circle wow we're going oh. back to fine dining for this one I'm stressed. I'm a bit stressed about it too. This book, the next book that we will be doing is The French Laundry. (laughs) I don't know why I'm delivering this like a diagnosis. <laughs> because does anyone know a like truffle dealer? Because that's all I've seen in it so far. Is everything else truffle with it? I've got a guy. Uh, do you? Text his number, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's another beast, but in a different kind of way, isn't it? It's very square. It's a square book. Yeah, it's way heavier than it looks like it's going to be as well. Like when I picked it up from my doorstep, I was like, whoa. Your doorstep. Into the Amazon guy fling it at the door like a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> With my newspaper, yeah. There's a big dent in my door from the corner of it. Also, I feel like the the cover is already setting the tone for this book because it's not of food, it's not of any beautiful ingredient. It's a white plate with a very carefully folded napkin that's been clipped with a little bougie peg. And you're like, oh shit, lads, we're going to have our little pipettes and squeezy bottles. I think it's fair to say, don't expect either of us to do more than one thing <laughs> from this. Like, I don't think Hannah's going to even get to her cop out third thing. Like, it's it's very, very fine dining. There's a lot of caviar. Like I said, there's a lot of trouble. <laughs> He's even put quick... He's got a a section on quick sauces and even he knows that that's a joke. He's put quick in inverted commas. So we already know that that's a lie. Thomas, we're on to you. But no, uh, French Laundry. It was on the list. It's on the list. There's actually a great clip on YouTube of Anthony Bourdain going to eat at French Laundry, which I might rewatch in prep for the next one. But it's obviously one of the, if not the most celebrated fine dining restaurant in the US. So it will be, it'll be interesting. We're going to get posh. We are going to get posh. I don't know how it's going to go. No, I don't even know if there's veggie stuff in it. I saw an egg. I saw an egg, but it may have come with... Uh, I saw, <laughs> That's my one thing I saw. Was it the one you didn't put in the cornbread? <laughs> yeah, I've got enough eggs. So when I fuck it up six times... <laughs> so yes, join us for that one. It should be interesting. Wish us luck. Send us tips. We might be bitching a lot on that one. We'll see. It might be a really short episode. <laughs> yeah. But for all the recipes that we talked about today, if we can find them online, we'll put them onto the website, thecookbookcircle.com. And you can also sign up to our new email there. Yes, please do. Thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Cookbook Circle. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave us a review as it helps others to find us. You can see how the recipes from this episode turned out on our Instagram, at Cookbook Circle. And if you make anything from the books we talk about, please don't forget to tag us. See you next time. Bye. Bye.